The Chinese Communist Party's twice a decade national congress will begin less than a month from now in Beijing on October 16th. It will bring President Xi Jinping closer to an unprecedented third term in power. Now, over the next few weeks, we'll explore some of the challenges that China faces as the key meeting looms. But first, we'll take a closer look at the country's fast-growing overseas investments, which is welcome and feared in parts. Mohammed Shamin is a railway enthusiast, so working on the 665-kilometer East Coast rail link connecting the less developed East Coast to the West Coast of Malaysia is a dream come true. The 24-year-old site coordinator was hired by Chinese state-owned China Communications and Construction Company, CCCC, to work on a project after having completed a two-month training program four years ago. For me, I'm lucky to have the opportunity to gain the knowledge and experience that I need to uh, further my career professionally in the future also. Under an agreement signed with the Malaysian government, locals must make up 70% of CCCC's workforce in Malaysia and 40% of its civil engineering work, excluding the tunneling jobs, must be awarded to local contractors. The East Coast Rail Link, or ECRL, is China's flagship project in Southeast Asia under President Xi Jinping's signature Belt and Road Initiative. Since 2013, total cumulative Belt and Road spending by China has reached over 932 billion US dollars in countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Now targeted to operate beginning 2027, the ECRL aims to serve as a land bridge connecting the less developed east coast of Peninsula Malaysia to the west coast with a forecast capacity to ferry 5 million passengers and 26 million tonnes of cargo in the first year of operation. But it suffered from numerous delays due to a change of government in Malaysia, protracted COVID-19 lockdowns and global supply chain disruptions. With the lifting of movement restrictions and reopening of the economy, CCCC is pledging full steam ahead to complete the rail link as scheduled by 2026. Not only CCCC, <laughs> for all Chinese companies, single project uh, uh, is largest one, biggest one. So it's very important that it gets off the ground on schedule in January 2027. Uh, yes. Are it, you confident? We make uh, the promise to the government of Malaysia this ECR will in our top priority position. When completed, the rail link is expected to half travel time from Kota Baru in the east coast to Klang Valley in the west coast to just under four hours. Apart from spurring development of townships and commercial hubs along the rail link, the project is expected to boost the social economic conditions in Malaysia's rural east coast. That includes creating some 23,000 jobs when construction of the project reaches its peak next year. Already, many local suppliers and vendors are heavily reliant on the rail project. To find out more about the significance and viability of the project, as well as China's growing influence in Southeast Asia, I visited Professor Dr. Niao Chao Bing, director of the Institute of China Studies at University Malaya. Just like the China Laos uh, Railway, they have to show that China's uh, BRI is workable, sustainable, uh, is well accepted and can bring real benefits. So the symbolic, the diplomatic meaning of it, uh, for China, it matters a lot. You need to show that China can complete the project. Whether the route itself is going to be commercially viable um, is still de debatable. Some would say that it will never, never uh, be commercially viable. Therefore, you will need a lot of government subsidies and it's going to drain our resources. 
The ECRL comes with a hefty price tag of over 11 billion US dollars, most of it funded by Export and Import Bank of China. But there are concerns that Malaysia could end up losing the rail or more if it cannot repay the loan. Chinese lending practices could be somewhat less careful compared to the traditional lending practices. So in that sense, a serious debt situation can occur. But I don't think there is a purposely malign design, a strategic foreign policy through to trap countries into a perpetual debt. But while Malaysia welcomes Chinese investments, like many other countries in Southeast Asia, locals have also grown uneasy about the influx of Chinese nationals. They point to the many Chinese restaurants, convenience stores and massage centres that have sprouted across townships that are populated by the Chinese. There are said to be over one million mainland Chinese living in Malaysia. Now, this hot pot restaurant, run by the mainland Chinese, is one of the hundreds in Kuala Lumpur. And they are quite popular with locals. In fact, some Malaysian businesses are secretly worried that they may lose out if more, like this, are open. The culture is totally different. They have difficulty understanding the locals' concerns. For them, it may not be a big issue, but for some of us here, it is a big issue. We see that happening, but they do not really assimilate in the community. Political watchers say China needs to engage more with local stakeholders and not just those holding power if it wants to be likeable and acceptable. I think people don't necessarily reject uh, China's uh, projects, fundings, uh, capital and vaccines. I think they do welcome, but they are afraid that they will be overly dependent on China. Um, they may feel that uh, by becoming too dependent on China, they will lose their autonomy. So the rising influence doesn't really necessarily translate to uh, acceptability. acceptability or acceptance. But for now at least, these concerns are far from the minds of Saifu Hakimin and villagers from Malaysia's less developed east coastal states. For them, it's all about how the Chinese investments will improve their lives. Baguslah, menjimatkan masa nak pergi ke Kuala Lumpur, Kota Baru kan. Kalau free lagi suka, jimat try je lah kan. Okay, tapi laju. Laju kan? Laju. Uh, laju. <laughs>
While China's ambitions of a modern silk route haven't materialized in Nepal, its presence and influence can still be seen in parts of Kathmandu, which would have been part of the ancient silk route. Nepal's trade ties with China go back centuries, but its economy has never been so reliant on Beijing. Despite all these things happening between Nepal and China, China is not really, my, that's my point of view, not really uh, creating the uh, employment uh, for the locals. Nearly a fifth of Nepalese youth between 19 and 29 years are unemployed. Solving this problem could make China more popular among the local population. Though some Chinese projects like the Pokhara International Airport have created jobs in Nepal. Funded by a loan of 200 million US dollars from China's Exim Bank, it's among the biggest Chinese projects currently in the works in Nepal and is expected to boost spiritual and adventure tourism. Tourists say Jada or you they say European say American say look Jada like in salmon bulk make her look. So Paida Matlab Sabi Saman is also antique type of salmon right type Purana salmon, or they say tea bagger, chai ka tea, alag alag type ka tea do. Nepal's economy is driven by tourism. The sector is the fourth biggest employer and accounts for a tenth of the country's GDP. In the past decade, the influx of Chinese tourists has sparked an interest in learning Mandarin. In Mira Shreshtha's Mandarin class, nearly everyone works in the tourism industry. Students say learning Mandarin will also allow them to interact better with Chinese tourists when China finally opens up its borders. It will also open up opportunities for them to benefit from Asia's biggest economy. There are at least a dozen Chinese language institutes like this, just in this neighborhood. The Chinese government, too, has opened up two language centers under the Confucius Institutes since 2015. It's one of the ways the country is wielding crucial soft power scripting a new chapter in Nepal-China relations. But China's influence is worrying another of Nepal's neighbor, India. The country's relationship with Nepal is rooted in a common culture and history that goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. But of late, Delhi has emerged as a more minor partner to Kathmandu in comparison to Beijing. India and Nepal's relationship has always had its ebbs and flows, but now New Delhi may be looking for course correction. It's recently taken on the West Seti River Dam project some 500 kilometers away from here that was being originally constructed by the Chinese. And many think that it's a sign that India is increasingly taking Kathmandu seriously and wants to bring it back into its fold. By pressing the launch bike, you know, so they're building schools in the uh, in remote areas as well. Uh, but I don't think they have really tried to uh, benefit or cash on uh, those types of uh, developmental projects. Uh, whereas uh, Chinese now, you know, it's, uh, they're coming uh, very, very uh, strongly and they want some sort of, you know, so uh, reciprocity as well. After allegations that China buried Sri Lanka under debt to take over its assets, Nepal's relationship with Beijing is showing signs of strain. Though China argues that accusing it of engaging in debt trap is just plain wrong. When leased the uh, port, China will also give money to Sri Lanka government. I think that's a good arrangement. But later, the, the West made a story that China made a trap. But actually, that was not the case. Still, the question of trust in China looms large over both public and private partnerships, as information about their source of funding can be hard to come by. In fact, if you meet a Chinese businessman, you just don't know uh, how strong he is you now, uh, uh, you know, in terms of financially or business-wise, you know, because he may be just the front, you know, 
right? Uh, behind him, maybe uh, huge, you know, uh, he, may, he may have, to, you know, access to huge resources, you know, uh, uh, other, uh, maybe the, even the state may be helping, maybe not the central government, but, you know, all they have their provinces, you know. Analysts say Nepal's ruling party is losing faith in China's promise of no strings attached developments. And this could create an opportunity for India to capitalize on this mistrust to bolster its influence in South Asia. I think, uh, you know, India certainly cannot match dollar for dollar. There is an assessment in New Delhi that India needs to step up, India needs to do much more. While both China and India are hoping to shore up support in South Asia, Sri Lanka and Nepal too face a tough balancing act. That's the promise of support from both sides. But also concerns that the two Asian giants may end up dominating the relationship. Kampala, Uganda's capital. This is a city on the move. And for the millions of trips taken to and from the city regularly, it's moving a lot faster now on this, the Kampala Entebbe Express Highway. The four-lane dual carriageway stretches 51 kilometers long, linking the capital city to the country's largest airport and features several bridges and underpasses. It officially opened to traffic in 2018. The $476 million road project was jointly funded by the government of Uganda and China's Exim Bank. The lion's share of Africa's infrastructure initiatives are being driven by financing from China, making the Asian giant a central player in Africa's push towards urbanization. For Uganda, this road symbolizes a key shift in its relationship with the Asian giant. We are therefore very grateful for this principled and decisive economic support from our friends of China. The new road means thousands of Ugandans can shift their businesses into a higher gear. Taxi cab driver Emmanuel Oguang plies this road almost every day, picking up and dropping off clients at the main Entebbe International Airport. On this road, you actually save a lot of time because on the old road, if you pass there, you use about an hour or even more maybe two hours, but with this road, it's just 30 minutes or 40 minutes to Kampala. While the road has made easy access for travelers, it has also changed the fortunes for traders like Joel Katambula. His furniture workshop is meters away from this highway. business, <laughs> Uganda is implementing an ambitious infrastructure program whose funding currently comprises about 32.8% of the government's total annual expenditure. The program involves the construction of roads and hydroelectric power projects and industrial parks, most of them financed by China. Over the past dozens of years, we have seen fast growth in Africa, averaging 8% per year before the pandemic. And uh, I think this mega trend will continue. So there's a vast opportunity for China. Uganda's neighbor to the north, South Sudan, is getting assistance from China to set up an air traffic management system at three different locations in the country. South Sudan's upper airspace is still managed by Sudan, from which it became independent more than 10 years ago. We 
呃，中国金融广银行向南苏丹提供的第二笔优惠贷款。In the Horn of Africa, a 750-kilometer railway line now connects Ethiopia's capital Addis Ababa to a port in neighboring Djibouti. 70% of the 4.2 billion U.S. dollar standard gauge railway was financed by favorable loans from China. The demand for roads, railways, ports and energy infrastructure in Africa remains high and China seems to be a willing partner for many governments. But economic analysts argue that the Chinese Belt and Roads Initiative is likely to be a dead trap for most African nations. So there's a debate in the public on uh, the, the model China adopts, which is essentially a bilateral model and sometimes uh, loans. And the jury's out there. I think it's a bit early to make a call on, on the impact on infrastructure. But I think in Africa, we welcome infrastructure. I think the next stage uh, in the development of infrastructure is to build sustainable and resilient infrastructure and to ensure that from a commercial perspective that the infrastructure is able to pay back itself. The rest of the world is taking note of China's investment in Africa. And it's not the only global power making investments here. These are countries that are pursuing their interests. China, United States, uh, you, you know the countries that are here. India, Turkey, Israel. You, you can mention Russia is all over the place. You can mention all of them. The Europeans are here. So, in other words, you can't say their involvement. Is it good or bad? Because they are going to be involved, whether good or bad. The, the, the important question for me is, what are you doing? And there's much more to do. More than 50% of the people in the 54 African countries live in rural areas, people whose lives could change drastically with investment in infrastructure. Imagine uh, an area without a healthcare facility and two years or a year later they have a good hospital. Imagine the impact it will have on women, children and the community as a whole. It improves life expectancy expectancy, improves the quality of life, the impact is all around. But China's ongoing economic slowdown has cast a shadow on its overseas investment. COVID-19 and the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine has led several countries to default on their external debt or suffer from debt distress. And while China has been able to offer rescue loans, its ability to finance the Belt and Road Initiative alone in future could be hampered if its economy continues to falter.